welcome. It is a real, real thrill for me to see you all since Christmas, and uh, I'm delighted to be back in the conduit. Thank you for having us. It's such a beautiful space to hang out in. My name's Sue Pritchard, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Food Farming Countryside Commission, and we are your co-hosts for this evening. How many of you the food system is broken? Fair few. And of course it, it is, when you start to think about it. Diet-related ill health is now costing the country, conservatively, £50 billion pounds a year. Farmers, farmers earn less than the minimum wage. The effect of farming has been damaging precious ecosystems for the last 60 years. Our river ecosystems are really struggling in places in the Wye Valley where I farm. It's close to being completely dead as a result of agricultural pollution, among other things, but largely agricultural pollution. And yet, the food system that we think is broken isn't broken for everyone. For some people, for some businesses, incredibly well. For some businesses, they are able to make enormous profits, eye-watering profits, from researching, developing, making, and marketing foods that are bad for us and bad for the planet. The story of ultra-processed foods isn't just about the thing that you've got on your plate. It is the thing that tells us a story of how the food system in the UK and around the world, who it's working for, who it is not working for, who it is harming, what it is harming, and most importantly of all, what we have to do to change that, to get to a healthier, fairer, greener food system that we want. And I am so thrilled this evening to have the most fabulous panel to tell the story of that interconnected food system from what's on a plate, but also what's grown in the fields, how it gets to the plate. I'm hand over, there you are, who is going to be our host for this evening. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, the one, my one job. My one job. Can we, all, can we all agree that it's because I'm very crippled? My brain's obviously in my toe. The one job, my one job, the work that we're doing, the work that we're doing, <laughs> <laughs> the work that we've been doing to help change the conversation. Lots of people have been writing some brilliant reports in the last five years alone, but actually many folk have been working on this for decades. But in the last few years, we've been producing reports. Henry Dimbleby produced the National Food Strategy, partners in the Food Foundation, in Soil Association, lots of organizations in the UK and globally have been producing brilliant reports telling more of the story that I just touched on earlier. And yet government and business is declining to act on those reports and those recommendations. And the reason that they give for declining to act is because they say people don't want them to. Nobody wants a nanny state. We can't afford to do this in a cost of living crisis. Nobody wants to be told what to eat. And anybody, people really don't care about this. This is a middle class obsession. Artisan food is a, is a thing that only the middle classes care about. This was not our experience at FFCC. We spent a lot of time talking to citizens in communities all around the UK. So we decided once and for all, having heard those excuses, once too many, that we would go out and ask citizens what they think. And this is what they said. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. One, two, three, testing one, two, three. Right, so uh, my name's Faisal. Um, I have two, two lovely children, one aged seven and ten, um, and a lovely wife, and we live in a nice little house. It's a very, very 
complex system. I now kind of look at food in a little bit more different way. So when I'm picking up a, a piece of fruit or a piece of food or whatever it might be from the supermarket, I'm, I'm looking at and thinking, okay, so how much of the profit is going to the farmer? How much of the profit is going uh, to the supermarkets? How is it made? I'm Steve. I come from Cambridge. I lived in Cambridge for my whole life, or just around it. Um, I don't know really. I it's hard. I I I guess some of the problems are so uh, severe that there does need to be a level of intervention from the government to ensure that people's practices are for best for their own health and for the environment. Uh, my name is Nirala Begum. I'm an assistant head teacher in a local grammar school. I'm also a mother of two and a wife to my husband. My son drinks sugary drinks like nobody's business and I was thinking where did I go wrong with that? My name is Susan. I'm a carer and someone who has health issues myself. I think it's very hard to uh, stay healthy if you go into hospital because the hospital food often contains processed foods and for me that makes me very ill. My name is Naz and I'm a minibus driver, uh, father of five children, husband, um, a brother um, and a son um, and my uh, priorities are my family keeping them healthy and safe. Uh, yeah, I think um, all I see now, advertisements, is new fast foods opening up all around Birmingham. And uh, burgers, burgers, burgers. My name is Sophia, and I am a mother of two children. Just literally driving in the car, you see a McDonald's or a KFC or something there. Um, majority of the buildings that have been derelict or pubs that have been derelict are turned into fast food restaurants. My name is Jodie. I live with my husband, Paul, and little boy, Miles. Um, there was lots of people from different backgrounds, different ages, different nationalities, and everyone came together and I felt like everyone agreed on the core views. Um, we all felt for the farmer, we all wanted to be a healthier nation, we all wanted the government to provide policies and guidance for the big corporations uh, and distribute the wealth a little bit more fairly. So we do need the politicians uh, to kind of get on our side. We've got the facts, we've got, we've got the case studies, we know where we need the help, we just need the help from you guys. Well, I hope that we can um, find a way of feeding the world <laughs> uh, without um, damaging the environment so much and, um, and making sure that you know, we can eat health, healthy food uh, that gives everybody a better quality of life. Sylvester and I'm a columnist at the time of our Times Health Commission um, which we've been doing for a year now which has been pretty full-on and intense but what was so interesting is what started out as a commission on the NHS and social care we quickly realized you couldn't ignore the food system and uh, the implications and on long-term illness uh, and multiple conditions that so many people have. Uh, so when we produce our report next week, we're going to come up with lots of recommendations for improving uh, the health of the nation, but including the food system. What was so interesting is that actually the polling that we did for the Health Commission showed there's really overwhelming public support for the government to do more. We found people three, three to one in favor of the government doing more as opposed to the government doing less. Uh, and way more people thought the government should do more than thought the government was doing. Um, and there's strong support for lots of measures that are seen as nanny state, 
Uh, I think the public has this sense that they're being exploited by the food system that exists at the moment and by some of the large corporations. Although interesting, we also heard from business, they too want the government to do more to create a level playing field among them because otherwise they say they can't be the sort of first mover, they have to jump together. Otherwise, uh, any one company doesn't want to be uh, left behind in profit terms. But if they all go together, they know they've got to do something. Uh, it's better for everyone. Uh, so I think there is, uh, we also did focus groups. Interestingly, we chose um, Blackpool and Isha and Walton, so two red wall and blue wall seats, swing seats in the general election. And in both of those seats, um, the voters really were in favor of the government doing sort of uh, this idea of the nanny state that has taken hold and part of the Conservative Party not all of it I think is out of step with where the voters are uh, so uh, and, and actually really interestingly Keir Starmer has now almost seized the mantle of the nanny state he's almost wearing it with pride and Rishi Sunak today with his announcement on smoking and vaping is also taking on that side of his party although they've backed away from a lot of the measures that were planned on food. So there's a lot more to do. Um, but I think it's going to be an interesting dividing line at the general election, potentially. Um, so that brings me on to the really fascinating panel that we've got today. Um, and I'm going to need to put my glasses on now. Um, so Tim Benton here, it leads the Energy, Environment and Resources Program at the Chatham House Think Tank. He's a professor at Leeds University and has worked with the UK government, the EU and the G20, as well as the World Economic Forum on food, land and climate policies. Chris Van Tulliken is a nutrition academic at UCL, a doctor and a best-selling author of ultra-processed food, very on brand for this evening. And he's also an advisor to the WHO and UNICEF on food and nutrition. Eddie Abu, next to Chris, is, an, uh, um, is a prominent figure in the bodybuilding community who's well-placed to talk about the impact of ultra-processed food on fitness levels. Rob Percival is head of food policy at the Soil Association and author of The Meat Paradox, a book that explores the cultural complexity of meat. At the end, has, has had a long and distinguished career as a journalist, including as a newspaper editor, a publisher and author, before being appointed to the House of Lords. And she also developed the new London food strategy for Sadiq Khan and was chair of the London Food Board for several years, showing that you can actually make a difference. So the speakers are going to be speaking in that order, and each person has precisely seven minutes. And I've been told to be very strict at cutting you off. So I will do this if ever anyone goes over their time. And I'm very bossy when I want to be. Um, so Tim, could you just start? By answering that icebreaker question, what is the definition of ultra-processed food? Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I don't want to dance on the head of a definitional pin. It's a bit like um, I grew up reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's a bit like quality. You kind of know what it is when you... I pick, picked from the literature one of my favourite definitions, which comes from a paper by Steele et al. in British Medical Journal. Industrial formulations, which, besides salt, sugar, oils and fats, include substances not used in culinary preparations in the kitchen, in particular, to, in particular additives used to imitate sensorial qualities. So kind of just engineered industrial food, and I'm sure others would, can, can come up with a, de, the, uh, a better definition. But I think the danger is, uh, the, the same paper says uh, in the US, it's a US study, 60% of those in the US come from ultra-processed foods, so defined. And ultra-processed foods have eight times more sugars in them than uh, minimally processed or unprocessed foods. So the more ultra-processed foods you eat, the more sugars you eat, and, and so on and so on and so on. OK, I'll leave the detail to colleagues. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization published uh, just before COP last year uh, the annual state of food uh, and agriculture in the world. And that, for the first time ever, estimated the total costs of the food system on, bo on both health and environment. Total costs, 
$12.75 trillion, of which $9.3 trillion around the world is the healthcare costs from poor diets, of which most of that comes from high and upper, um, because of the associated costs of obesity and uh, the diseases that go with it, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, cancers, and so on. $12.75 trillion. Another report published just this afternoon, the uh, Food Security Eco Economic Commission, I think it's F FSEC, uh, comes up with even bigger numbers. They amount to about 10% of global domestic product GDP. 10% of the economy is the cost of the food system, largely on health. Okay, now I was particularly asked to here why, to, to, to come here and explain why we have a food system in the way that we do. Why, then, do we have a food system that largely feeds us in a way that is bad for our health and the planet? Well, it's predicated, following the Second World War, on the idea that we need more food, more available, and that would be better for society. I call this the cheaper food paradigm. And that has been reached over the last 50 or 60 years by two things. One is the intensification of agriculture, growing more and more and more per unit area. And the other, so countries that can grow lots for export have a global market and can make a lot of money. And that leads to something called the Jevons paradox. Jevons was a coal economist, a Victorian coal economist, who pointed out that if you made coal-fired power stations more efficient. But of course, what happened? You made coal-fired power stations more efficient. You used more coal because you made energy cheaper. And the food system has done exactly the same thing over the last 50 years. We've made more and more food, more and more available. We've repurposed it. We now feed lots of food to cattle. We have food that is freely available for many people in the world. It is uh, grown from a very small number of crops that can make huge amounts of profit on a global basis, grown at a huge scale, huge intensity, huge biodiversity costs, but create the underpinnings of our ultra-processed food uh, system. So palm oil, sugar, starches from maize and wheat and rice, um, potatoes, etc. Eight crops account for about 70% of the world's calories, and they are what makes our ultra-processed food uh, uh, product, ultra-processed food system. So we've known about this for decades. I've literally been giving this talk for 20-odd years. So why the hell do we not change our food system? And the reason is that we have three lock-ins. Um, I've got a nice colour diagram here that I'll just talk through. Three lock I rarely talk about. The first lock in is the political ideology that economic growth follows consumption growth. And it's our jo job as politicians to make sure that people consume more. And consuming more food is part of that. Part of that ideology is that markets provide the solution. It's not the job of governments to intervene and tell, tell people what to eat. If people want to eat what the market provides, that's fine. So that's the first lock-in, the political, ideological, cheaper food paradigm. And that leads to an environment where policy is stimulating the market via deregulating, getting rid of liberalizing the market, big trade, driving efficiency through scale, produce more and more and more and more, and targeting state support at the globally important, globally traded commodities. Those are the ones that give us the ultra-processed food. Those are the ones that give us the business models that are based on global volumes, uh, not on healthy diets. And those are the ones that support intensive food production grown at scale uh, and with the environmental uh, costs that that brings. That leads to the second lock-in. And the second lock-in is market concentration. So as soon markets are dominated by few big players who have significant interest in maintaining the status quo. And there is a huge lobbying industry that says, if you uh, help people eat healthily, jobs will be, a, 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 a lo jobs will be lost. Uh, 
is because we've invested so much in these ultra-processed food type diets and the crops that support them and global trade, we have complete lock-in from a path dependency perspective. And all of this means that investing in doing things in a different way is economically and politically very, very risky. So what we haven't tackled collectively, we've done the science, we know what we have to do, we have not tackled the politics and created the political space as we're finding across Europe at the moment with farmer protests around Paris, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't created the political I forgot how long have I got. One minute. One minute, okay, final points. God, I can't read this. Um, so, I'm enjoying this. Can I, can I give him one of my minutes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, mate. No, no, that, that's cheap. That's cheap. Um, so, the environmental sustainability of food we know is bad, biodiversity perspective, and environmental sustainability is often too distant and uh, in time and space for people. But health is really important. And if you think about what we spend our taxes on as a co country, education defense and health care and we're something like 26 percent of public ex expenditure goes on the nhs and about 10 percent goes on social social care of the working force population not retired people so a very significant chunk of our state expenditure our taxes go on health care as that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and worse, and worse when will our food system break the health service. And wherever you look, health is one of the three big things that people vote for. So will health and ultra-processed foods, bad ultra-processed foods, be the tipping point that makes people wake up and creates this Very good. Right on time. Um, yeah, one of the figures that shocked me most, actually, is I think it's spending on education has increased 3% since 2010. Spending on health, 42%. So it's just sucking out an ever-increasing proportion of the budgets. Uh, but Chris, can you, I wonder whether you could, among other things, just explain where the UK sits in relation to other countries. Because one of the things that's really shocked me is the fact that we are now the most obese country in Western Europe, third obese or obese, and that we are out of step with other countries increasingly. And is that because of ultra-processed food? So first of all, that was amazing, and I really enjoyed that. Um, and you did a lot of heavy lifting for me, actually. So I can, uh, we're living, I suppose, in an, in an emergency, and we, it, it's quite a long-term emergency for about 20 years. So we are, are um, our children particularly are most severely affected. Um, we can measure this with weight gain, and we have children who live with a greater degree of obesity or overweight than other children in Europe. But our children also at the age of five, so the age of my eldest daughter, are about this much than their peers in Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, or Northern Europe. And, and height is a really good proxy for nutrition. And we see that height deficiency in the same households and in the same bodies as the children who live with excess weight. And we have lots and lots of other ways, ways of measuring this. We are sure this is not due to migration, to genetic changes. This is due to uh, poor diet. And poor diet has now overtaken tobacco as the leading cause of early death for human beings globally. And I would say, internationally, the jury is in on what constitutes a poor diet. It is uh, an industrially produced American diet, fundamentally. So I am not, not an ultra-processed food Nova Group 4 purist. There are lots of ways we can define this food. How long have I got, just so I can keep an eye? Um, when until, have I got until? Um, Five past, second. no. Um, sorry, the clock's 1904. On hold. 1904. <laughs> My goodness. Going back in time. Eight minutes. Okay, okay. Um, you can define this food in lots of ways. There's a, a definition housed on the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization website. It's nine paragraphs long. None of you will ever read it. Um, we can say it's food with additives. We could also say it's almost any product made by a transnational food corporation. This is how they must make their money. Uh, commodity, beef, milk, eggs, they, they don't have intellectual property. You can't seek rent on them. So corporations don't make, make money from them. Um, uh, we could say any food with a health claim. If you look at, I've been talking a lot about Cocoa Pops. If you now look on a pack of Cocoa Pops, which is an ultra-processed food, it has a huge uh, picture of a family. 
It so supports the health of your high in vitamins, minerals enriched, uh, low in artificial uh, uh, flavors or sugars. All, all of that will be, uh, almost all of it will be ultra processed. Anything with a health claim. Um, the logic, as Tim said, for me is if you think of it from the point of view of, of a farmer growing a cob of corn, you can only extract so much value. We only want to eat buttered corn once a month at most. If you turn it into corn protein isolate, modified corn starch, high fructose, corn syrup, and corn oil, you provide the substrates for making ultra processed food. Um, so um, that its econ its logic is primarily economic. Now what? the evidence tell us about what the evidence says is that as a category of food ultra processed food an industrially processed diet is harmful to human health it's very clear about the category and ultra processed food has now been shown to be associated with lots of different problems in around 80 prospective cohorts so when when we reality this is the problem that all of us are interested in is is this food just eaten by people who live in disadvantage is it eat food eaten by people who are doing other things that harm their health. Is it just salty, fatty, sugary junk food? Or is it this food, independent of its nutritional profile, that is causing health problems? And I would say we have now uh, reached the threshold of causality. So I say that ultra-processed food causes dementia, anxiety, depression, cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, cardiometabolic disease, heart attacks, strokes, obesity and weight gain, and early death from all causes. Now, we can say that because we've got the kind of studies that we use to link tobacco products with lung disease, but also because we have lots and lots of uh, laboratory evidence and lots and lots of very plausible mechanistic thinking about how it might do this. So I can talk all afternoon uh, about how it harms us, less interesting than once we've established causality doing something about it. The tobacco industry were very, very skillful at, for many, many decades, uh, posing the question with a lot of very eminent scientists and doctors of, of going, well, we are concerned about this, but how is it happening? So um, figuring out the mechanisms is important, but it just from solving the problem. Um, briefly, it's extremely soft. Uh, it is engineered. Um, to drive excess consumption. It is high in fat, salt, sugar, um, the nutrients that we know uh, cause harm, uh, and it's uh, engineered um, for profit um, to, be, uh, to be nutritionally good for us. Um, so rather than delving into the way the additives affect us, um, I think the clearest thing to explain is when I spoke to lots and lots of people in the food industry, the way we develop foods um, is on using big testing. So we start with two different boxes of cereal, box A, box B. There might be a different synthetic emulsifier in box B or a different level of salt and fat and sugar in box A. These are tested on a room like you, and one of the main things we measure is how quickly do you eat the cereal and how much of it do you eat. Those are the metrics used by the food industry. And the box that people eat, that is the one that goes on the shelf. So you can think about every single product you eat has thousands of properties. It has a pH level a viscosity, shear forces to destroy it. It has phytonutrient levels. It has salt, fat, sugar, acid ratios. Every single one of these properties in every product you eat has been optimized to drive maximal consumption. You know, it's a really competitive market space. So agonizing about any one property is less interesting than understanding the incentives. Now, what the evidence doesn't... Th there's one more thing the evidence says. Now, I, I don't think we need to throw out all of our anxieties about fat, salt, and sugar. I don't think we need to overturn our current nutritional paradigm, okay, where we label food according to fat and salt and sugar. I do think we need to acknowledge that processing has an enormous effect on how much food we eat and on our health. Um, so when it comes to what we're actually... The evidence is very clear from these prospective trials that they all made adjustments for fat, salt, sugar, fiber, and dietary pattern. So what that means is if you make those statistical adjustments, you see that the effects on human health, on dementia, on cancers, on early death, remain the same in magnitude and significance. So that tells us that you can't reformulate your way out of the problem. You can strip the sugar out of the cola, and it seems to remain harmful. You can replace the fats with modified starches and xanthan gums and emulsifiers, and the food seems to remain harmful. And we've been reformulating now since the early 80s, replacing 
the fats first, and then seeing the sugars with non-nutritive sweeteners. And the problems, the health problems seem to be getting worse and worse and worse. So processing does matter. In terms of what the evidence doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us about exactly what we should do with policy. So saying that we've got this certainty about this category of food doesn't directly tell it or tax it or treat it all as one unit. So policy doesn't just flow in a very simple way from the evidence. Um, I think one of the most important things that should inform policy discussion is our knowledge of the tobacco industry. Now, lots of people have said the food companies are behaving a little bit like that understands the problem. From the mid-80s, the food industry and the tobacco industry were the same industry. They used their flavor molecules and their marketing techniques to bring us the universe of ultra-processed food that we see today. So where I'm left with is we need to learn the lessons of tobacco control. Um, thing is ending the conflicts of interest. At the moment, our Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition has a long list of conflicts, as Rob has pointed out on Twitter. All of our major charities are conflicted. You know, not all of, not all of, all of the major ones are. The British Nutrition F Foundation, for example. And many of the academics in this space take money from the food industry. That has to stop. We need a line in our national nutrition guidance. It sounds like a technical thing, but actually it's really important. Policy flows from there. And then we need to put warning labels on food. And once you get warning labels on food, and this has been done very successfully across South and Central America, um, you, you enable choice and freedom among consumers. So I have proposing suits both sides of the political aisle. I don't want to tax anything. No one's proposing any bans. We're talking about increasing choice, availability, and freedoms. Thank you, Rachel. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, my my favourite example was in Chile, where they they banned from their version of Frosties, and they had to have a plain package with this sort of black coffin-shaped warning about all the terrible dangers of the food. Um, so that sounds. I thought it was a great idea. Um, Eddie, can you talk through what your experience shows and what we can learn from the fitness industry? I am a. I was a professional bodybuilder, i.e. I'm also a qualified nurse, psychiatric nurse. And when I was nursing, when you went into the wards, I mean, with the training I did was dynamic. It was very, like, behavior modi modification programs that were really good. And then when you got onto the wards, you had and 40 patients, you were a cleaner. And I, didn't, I couldn't get on with it, so I stopped. But then what I noticed was, as soon as you got on the wards, they gave the patients cereal with sugar on it, and then they'll fall asleep. And the ones, that, the ones that didn't fall asleep, they played up, called it playing up. They were giving injections, and my, that still goes on now. And I couldn't help but um, notice that there was a relation between what they were eating and um, you know, how, they, you know, how they were behaving. But that was, um, I gave up nursing. I became a fitness professional, a British bodybuilding champion. And then I bought my own gym. And I was to get them ready for competitions. And then eventually, um, after lockdown, everything changed. Or oh, you got to stop going to Eddie. Eddie will make you eat real food. So <laughs> that's what, then it changed. Slowly, I found young men and women coming to the gym, spotty faces, suffering from depression. And the first meal they ate was Cocoa Pops, muffins. We finished training. They have a bowl of Cocoa Pops. And I saw the same behavior that my patients were displaying in the 80s. And I set out to make a change. So I started making videos on TikTok, screaming and shouting and swearing <laughs> and calling, calling every, everything shit. I mean, last time I, like they, they was, they, because I was doing the same thing on, on um, um, Facebook, but I was writing prose, you know, very intellectual stuff, stuff that, you know, with research, no one read it until I started telling them, <laughs> This is fucking shit. You know, and, and, and I mean, see, they are very, very hyperbolic. That's, that's the only way people, and then, but slowly I noticed the change. People are making changes to their diets and the testimonials are coming in. So I personally think that if we educated the, the younger people, I mean, my team are over here. The reason why they became my team, because they saw, they're in their 20s, they saw my videos and they changed their diets. You know, acne, um, IBS, all of them have been cured just by changing their diets. And it's crazy. And um, so and then I started getting kicked out of supermarkets like Tesco's have kicked me out. Tesco's have kicked me out, asked me to 
leave. We are, that's shopping with my daughter in Tesco. The guy comes up, we well, can't you can film me. I'm like, well, everybody else is filming this altercation. How come you're stopping me? Well, because, because I'm wearing a mic, or took the mic off, but still, I got kicked out. I got kicked out of um, Holland and Barrett. That's, <laughs> that's supposed to be a health, health sh in this cell. You know, you got, I'm not, I, 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 Chris, you've been to Holland and Barrett. You, um, so I walked into the shop and I said, all oh, that shit in the health food shop. Just one sentence and walked out. The manager came in, you're not allowed to. So I'm not allowed into a lot of shops. <laughs> and... and <laughs> Sometimes I have to put on a big afro and a funny uh, fake nose. I have to do that because I believe that I'm making a change. You know, it's, and I'm hitting the grass. You know, the, the, the people are the people who would not bother listening to any intellectual conversations. They're not interested. They want to know, can I eat this? I'm going to, because of this industry, we are very insecure. I don't know if you're aware of it. Most of us are insecure. We only worry about, worry about how, how we look. So we're not looking at, if, if, and most of us, we're not the smartest, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're not the sharpest knives in the, in the tube, they say, <laughs> we, we're, not the, we're not the smart, you know, that's, you know what I mean. So it's very easy to pull the wool over our eyes and, and I'm there screaming at people. And, but I'm glad to say that it's working because most some people are making changes and my daughter's actually showing people how to cook and make food, bland food. People say it's bland, but I don't care because I'm trying to teach people to realize that in the 80s when I started in the fitness industry, I was told that fitness was synonymous with cooking. But unfortunately, we went away from that. All this ultra I sit in my gym. I own a gym and somebody came after training and then muffins and the pop tarts and you think you're a fucking idiot <laughs> but, but but that's what that's what they've been that's how that's how they've been educated with them so when they start eating properly started feeling better they're like oh my god eddie's right of course i was right <laughs> how can you replace real food with all this um chemical and grain shit that is on, on in our shelves anyway so that's why i'm here <laughs> One minute early, but Brilliant. you made up for with. <laughs> I'm sorry that I had to use that language. That, that seems the only I one about that. Getting out my knife and glass, but then... <laughs> <laughs> that's the only one that seems to um, resonate um, with the young people who I'm targeting, and I'm glad it's working. And I mean the feedback, and I put them on my Insta story every day. We get hundreds of people saying, "Eddie, thank you. You saved my life. You changed my life. I feel better. My family is eating better because of you." And I'm happy that that's happening. Thank you. So we're now going to have some questions about the health side of this debate. Um, and the first question is from James Toop, who's the CEO of Bite Back. Where are you, James? Do you want to gra grab a microphone? I think we've got one coming. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I run Bite Back 2030. Normally we would uh, be channeling the voices of young people, and I thought the stories uh, at the start from the, the commission were fantastic, um, but there wasn't a young person there. And I think what young people would say that they're up against now um, is, is a flood of um, unhealthy food advertising. It, it's sort of woven into the culture of what young people see. So from the moment they get up, uh, they'll turn on their phones, what they'll see is a social media influencer, the, probably the other side of what Eddie does, uh, convincing them that there's a new energy, and they'll see that advert on the bus stop on the way to school, they'll buy it on the way to school. Um, they are consumed by these ads. And I think there is a bigger mm -hmm. cultural war. We've talked about uh, the food industry, but I think the social media companies, uh, sports teams, um, influencers are all wrapped up in this and are furthering the profits of big food. So my question to the panel is, is, is the tipping point going to come from the food industry or is it going to come from a cultural wave that starts to stand up to this and demand change? Who wants to go first Can on I that? Eddie, first? yeah. I, I, I'm at the, when I say I'm at the bottom, I see the average person who comes to the gym. And I think the change is happening from the bottom. I think people are realizing that, oh my God, I can actually feel better by not eating, having these energy drinks. And um, we've got some energy drinks in the gym that's not been bought because people are realizing slowly. And I think it's just slowly, you know, it's happening. I think it's, 
it has to happen from the paperwork, the product paperwork, they spend the money, because nothing is going to come from the top. It's all about money. Rosie, do you want to come? Um, yes, I think that's a really, really good point. And the fact that the government, you know, one of the few anti-obesity measures that was passed was to try to stop uh, junk food advertising during kids' television has delayed until sometime next year, um, again, without a date. But when it came up in the parliament the other, quite recently, uh, a particular Tory peer came up with the line that actually the advertising only accounts for one calorie. Now, I do not know where he got it from, but if you read his register of interest, he has actually 17 paid jobs in the media industry. And it's all about money at this point. It's entirely about money. I mean, I used to chair Veg Power. We worked a lot with ITV and Channel 4. And you know, they, they at one point tried to argue with the government that they should not have this restriction, which is a sort of wonderful about turn. And you have to follow the money in this debate. And that's, in fact, what the government does as well. They get enormous media pressure. They are huge advertisers. If you look at the whole world of food, 96% of the advertising money goes on junk food. There is, as Chris and Tim have said, there's zero value in trying to advertise broccoli. You don't get anywhere. So you advertise what you can put your license on and put your, you know, your name on. And that's where we have to break it. It won't come from the industry. It has to come from the government because they want the level playing field. And in a way, they sort of deserve it too. Chris, do you think it's the way of winning the wider argument? Because children yeah. are very emotive, and actually everyone can agree children should be protected. Or well, not everyone, but a lot of people. <laughs> More people. I don't really. I, th I think you need two things. I think a mandate to act, obviously. So there needs to be popular support to be protected from food. If Top-down regulation never works. But ultimately, part of the problem is that the entire sector, from the influencers to the charities to the academics, partner with this industry. And there is a sense from government that uh, will work. And it has to be a regulatory relationship. We, we know that from within the companies, we've got an amazing example at, at Danon. Emmanuel Faber, I think, tried to make sincere efforts to turn Danon around and was fired by activist investors. The companies are not in control of their business business model, and they need to be regulated like pharma, like aviation, like tobacco, like all the industries that affect human health. Tim, did you want to come in? Yes. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a conversation with somebody who was quite senior in the Treasury, uh, talking quick, and he said, Tim, don't be naive. If everybody ate a healthy diet, our economy would shrink because we would have to employ fewer doctors and fewer nurses, and GDP would go down. And I think that is the aspect of the ideology that we can that it is in our national interest for the economy to grow. And if the economy is growing year on year, if GDP is positive, that means consumption is growing exponentially. And if consumption is growing in the food system, we are getting fatter. So somehow we've got to confront this issue that the profits are always going to be made by selling more. And we could buy more and waste more, but we buy more and eat more too. So I think we do have to get to that political space where we make it sexy for politicians to want to intervene and squash the economy a little bit in the name of our long-term health and get off this bandwagon that economic growth is always the best thing because it patently isn't. Also, there's a lot of people off work sick, um, partly because of unhealthy food, probably. Um, so uh, I'm very strict with the audience now. One more question. OK, go ahead. You're first with your hand up. Hi, uh, Chris Young from The Real Bread Campaign. Uh, how and when do the panel think uh, that true cost accounting is going to come into play? By which I mean that are currently displaced or hidden around food in terms of health, in terms of environment, in terms of our communities. When is that going to be accounted for financially so that the big corporations that are making, for example, an industrial white sliced loaf, which is 
not bread, by the way. Uh, how help them to actually pay for that in terms of what health and environmental and social costs that might be having? Chris, do you want to answer that first? Because you did say the, uh, in an interview a few months ago that actually the price of a loaf of bread was so high if, you, if it were really at its true rate. Do you want to just... Well, sophisticated answer. I'm actually quite optimistic about the ability of industry to adapt to effective regulation. So if, if we imagined a world in which we regulated ultra-processed food, much like they do in South America, using a nutritional profile system, a, a big black warning octagons on it, we know that that makes, and I'm pretty sure we'd see the rise of a whole new industrial sector producing whole food. We'd invest in crop genetics, new varieties of plants and heritage breeds, and I, I kind of feel it would all be okay. I'm not sure there are many examples, if I think through any of the ones I know about, where we've seen it really crush down an economic sector when it's effectively regulated. So, um, I, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that industry will, will adapt. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> No, so, so true cost accounting is coming in in terms of the FAO, UN's FAO, uh, State of Food and Agriculture 2023 and the FSEC report out today. We are starting to get to grips with the real costs. But just think across Europe at the moment, all of the farmer protests. I mean, there was one uh, uh, tweet I saw about France last week that farmers were uh, demonstrating about the risk of drought whilst trying to kick off environmental regulation to manage climate change. So it's in their interest to take the long view, but all across Europe, industries is on the streets, ULES, low traffic neighborhoods. You know, they're just such wedge issues in terms of People, want, people not wanting to change, and the incumbent power of the big business based on the ultra process supply chains, enormous. So I think we can change it. We could regulate it. We could put on carbon accounting. We could do a whole range of different things, but I don't think the political space, the Gijan type moment, the ULES type moment, just means that there will be lots of civil unrest if, if we try, try it, and yet the urgency is with us now over the next years, decades, to deal with climate change and, and other things as well as the health. But I can't see that political space until we as citizens stand up and say, fuck, so <laughs> <laughs> dear politicians, please will you do it for us. We can all <laughs> see Did you want to come in very yeah. briefly? Yeah, very briefly. I, I think that the big not joined up bit is to do with the environment yet and I mean I've always thought that if we had a really big advertising campaign which had your chocolate mousse and an orangutan losing its house back in Malaysia you would start to make a connection particularly with food causes deforestation causes animals to lose it and, and the disconnect is absolutely there in politics we had the Das Gupta report on the cost of environmental degradation and at the heart of that is the agricultural system which is the fast food system which is the stuff that everybody's talking about and it's like a list to be made in the British public's mind and certainly in the politicians mind that's the perfect segue into Rob, <laughs> who is going to be talking about the environmental consequences of ultra-processed food. Yeah, well done, Rosie. That was um, very smooth, very neat. <laughs> so I'm a uh, association. We've been working on this issue uh, for five years now or so. Um, we're a charity that campaigns for healthy and sustainable food and farming. And I think the grand conclusion that I've reached after five years working on this um, and it, it might sound controversial, is that ultra-processed foods are not the problem. That's the one message, ultra-processed foods are not the problem. The problem is a food system oriented towards ultra-processing. And this has been alluded to a couple of times tonight, but it's really important, shifting our focus from the product level, from this packet of biscuits, from that loaf of bread, to the food system that is driving uh, these human health harms and all the environmental harms associated with ultra-processed diets. And one way of um, thinking about this is, um, is if you're ill, if you have a fever, you might be sweating. Our food system is sweating ultra-processed foods, but they are symptomatic of an underlying illness, and it's the underlying illness that we need to 
treat, deal with, way to be healthy and have a food system. Um, so I'll come back to explain what that illness is a little later, but um, there have been some studies done on that product level. So there is some research uh, employing life cycle analysis, this approach where you look in someone's shopping basket, you take all the individual products and you analyze the environmental impacts from farm to fork with each other. This, uh, this research has been employed in various uh, fields. It's only recently been applied to ultra processed products and the evidence seems to suggest that there are indeed energy savings, greenhouse gas savings to be made from shifting to a less highly processed diet. There are additional costs uh, in, in resource use and particularly in energy and greenhouse gas emissions which come from the industrial processing, from the use of plastics, from, from transport around the world and so on. So the, the evidence is still emerging but there are a handful of studies saying yeah it's pretty good bet that if you shift your diet all things being equal onto a less processed footing then it's probably. The complexity lies in the diversity of this ultra processed category. Uh, there's all sorts of products in here and they can actually have quite different effects. So if you take an ultra processed sausage, a meat sausage from a factory farm system and a plant-based alternative made from pea protein, that the, the meat sausage is gonna be worse for the environment. It's gonna have heavier environmental costs associated with the feed, the soya that was uh, grown in South America then shipped over to feed the pig or the manures killing the river nearby and so on. The pig probably had a pretty miserable existence as well. So even within the ultra processed category, there's a diversity of environmental impacts and probably you're better off eating the plant-based sausage than the factory farmed meat UPF sausage. But if you take a step back and look at the food system as a whole, then I think a much more interesting picture comes into view. Now the food system many of us will know is um, associated with all kinds of global greenhouse gas emissions, a leading driver of deforestation, habitat loss, wildlife destruction, species extinctions, pollution, eutrophication, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and this is really a food system oriented towards ultra processing. It's what it's designed to do, as, as Tim has already alluded to. Um, if we can witness this phenomenon that's called the, the nutrition transition. This is where locally distinct diets um, and indigenous food systems the world over are being overrun by a single diet, a Western diet, an Americanized diet, rich in two things, ultra processed foods and factory farmed meat. And these two come as a package. They're two sides of the same coin. They're a, a symbiotic relationship between the two within the food system. And the food system really works, as, as, as we've already heard, in, in an extractive linear manner. What you do is you take your fossil fuels, uh, you use them to process synthetic which is then applied chemically intensively grown crops, pesticides, this intensive cropping system, to produce this glut of commodity ingredients in order to add value, you then have to um, either pass those uh, crops through a factory farmed animal and sell its flesh, or you have to transform them into an ultra processed product. With it. Uh, you take the profits from that, uh, that sale and you invest in political influencing, lobbying and advocacy in pursuit of trade, deregulation, food system deregulation. Uh, and, and so the cycle repeats. This is the story that our food system has been locked into for, for several decades now. And we're now reaching a tipping point in the climate and nature crises where unless we unlock ourselves from that destructive cycle, um, we're gonna be at the point of, of no return. And this is why NOVA, I think, is such a, a powerful tool because it combines this political lens with a technical lens. The, the underlying sickness in our food is corporate capture. Okay, it's the financialization of food, the crude commodification of food systems and natural ecosystems in pursuit of shareholder returns. It's this that we need to address. It's a political problem. It's not a technical problem. We know how, the, how to address the climate and nature crisis on a technical level. It's the politics that we have to apply. Soil Association, Food Farming Countryside Commission, who are part of this global agroecology movement, are so interested in ultra-processed foods because it's a, a, a shared agenda uh, with, with this worldwide movement uh, to promote nature-friendly farming, fair supply chains, relocalized supply chains, and social equity, a whole, a whole package. And if we're going to get to where we need to be and address uh, the harms associated with our food system, then we have to invest in the, the political challenge and the political solution. And my, my final thought, um, uh, or my final comment, is to 
Bray's that a lot of this translated in a really neat way through into the, the dietary guidelines that we have in Brazil. Brazil is one of the countries that has integrated ultra-processing into its dietary guidelines alongside traditional nutrition science, but it also has this political analysis woven through it and a really clear message that a healthy and sustainable diet is one based around foods which are mostly plants with animal products eaten sparingly and sourced from agroecological farming systems. So there is a real template out there for the type of dietary guidelines that we should have here in the UK. And my hope is that in the years ahead, um, uh, we'll, we'll manage to elicit some of that language in our dietary guidelines because I think that's where we need to be. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we've now, we're now going to have some questions on this environmental aspect. If anyone, I'm going to take three questions at once just to give a few more people a chance to ask and then panellists can respond to whichever question they want. Yeah, there's a gentleman there, then somebody there. This is fancy. And then, um, and then, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the NOVA classification um, and what, I was quite, what I'm curious on is like, what part does the NOVA classification miss? out on when it comes to the uh, field of like UPFs and possibly like climate change and stuff like that, do you think that another classification could factor in more um, rather than just sort of how it's sort of defined? Um, okay, um, we're going to come back. Uh, are there, and uh, if there are some women who want to ask questions as well, I'm just, I, I'm going to take this question there and then there. So, yeah. Um, No offence to the men. Hi, yes, woman standing up. Um, the definition of UPFs is as clear as mud, isn't it? I think most people wouldn't be able to define as common man, common woman. To what extent do you think that affects the conversation around it and actually progress with UPFs? Thank you. Okay, and then there was a question um, by the pillar. Hi, I was just going to ask what effective regulation does and would look like. Okay, uh, so uh, Rob, did you want to come in on that first? Yeah. So the question? first question is, um, you know, what are the limits of the Nova definition, and um, and does it really address climate and nature and so on? And it's a good question because Nova is is quite precise in what it classifies foods according to. It's the degree and purpose of processing. And if you look just at the degree, as I said earlier, you have all sorts of products in this category. Um, and it's quite hard um, at a glance to disentangle which ones are going to be better or worse for the environment. But the key bit is the purpose of processing, because that's what positions these products within the political economy of the food system as designed for corporate gain at the expense, typically, of human health uh, and the natural world. So we do need to be careful that we don't overclaim uh, in, in relation to what NOVA tells us. It's not the whole story. There are other lenses you can bring to understand the sustainability of food, but it does bring us into that political space, which is really important in understanding how the food system as a whole is driving the, the types of environment. Eddie, do you have a view on this point about definition? I, uh, as soon as you mentioned about consuming more plants, I just got a bit worried because I believe that we as human beings are supposed to be um, more. And that's going to be very difficult because if that's not good for the environment, then what do we do? Can I? <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear me now. As soon as you mentioned about um, as concerned, I just thought, because um, I'm very soon I'm going to be a carnivore. I believe that we're meant to eat. Um, um, sort of animals, but then if it's not good for the environment, then what do we do? That's the that's the problem. Are we, you know, I'm I'm I was from the era where we all had allotments and we all grew our own, you know, plan for that. Is it a matter of encouraging people to do that? Because I think this is not going to be done from the top. Everything is controlled by money, and it's all about money. Even when it comes to the environment, it's money. Find that more people are making money out of it. And I think that's why we're all stuck. I'm stuck at the bottom trying to educate the average person that to feel better, you need to eat real food. And that's, what, um, that's why I'm here. Um, Tim, do you want to come in on the political side? Well, I, I also want to come in on the definitional side because I, I do agree 
that the ultra-processed food using, and it's used often by industry as a means of producing discord. I think Rob's framing, we know what a healthy diet is, and that is largely eating whole foods and diverse fruit and vegetables and a bit of meat and the sorts of things that your grandmother might have cooked, not the whole get microwave uh, kind of thing. So I, so I do think there's an element there that we can, as I said at the start, you can dance on the head of a definitional pin, pin about what is ultra-processed food, but it's quite clear what we should be eating instead of, of filling ourselves up, up, up with these things. Um, on the, the political economy stuff, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, it is, it is complex, but as I said in my opening remarks, the, and other people have echoed, the incumbency, the power of asymmetry, the economic uh, industry, the uh, revolving door between industry and regulation, means that we are, are kind of trapped in a system that is really difficult to break and breaking that system is like as likely to come from external events causing food shortages and all, all, all the rest of that and then the final thing what would good regulation look like that's a really good question um i would like to see a food system where the incentives are to produce food that is good you know, I had a conversation with Michael Gove years ago about it's in the post-Brexit cap, common agricultural policy, that nutritional health should be a public good, just like biodiversity should be a public good. I can imagine situations where planning law comes into, you know, can you have a fast food outlet at a school? I can imagine situations where there is a taxes on the wrong sorts of food. I can imagine situations where there are incentives on the right sorts of food, subsidies on the right sorts of food. You know, there are just so many things that could be done to change food environments, including uh, publicity and marketing and so on, that it's not a one-size-fits-all, that here is a silver bullet. Uh, in IPCC, or in a report I, I helped write a few years ago, we came up with 20-odd families of policy that could be used to change the regulatory environment, to change the food system. And as Rob said, it's about changing the food system. It's not just about banning ultra-processed food. Sorry. Pekka Pushka, who changed the system in Finland, had this brilliant phrase, everything everywhere. Um, Chris, did you want to come in? And then I'm going to take another question. I think, is that, is that working? Yeah. So the environment is, I think, a much more wicked problem to solve. If we look at it through the lens of health, because we have the ancestry with tobacco, because the products themselves, I think there's quite good evidence for that, very dramatic effects on human health. I think just as industry uses this tobacco playbook, where they use the molecules, the marketing technologies, the loyalty programs that they developed uh, with cigarettes, just as they use that to sell us the food. So we have a really effective playbook for tobacco control, and it is everything, everywhere. You, you, but, but there is still a hierarchy. The money becomes dirty, you label the packs, you ban them in schools, you ban them in public places. Then later on you have progressive taxes, maybe. Progressive taxes on food, more complicated. At the moment this is the only food people can afford. But I think we do have a playbook that need at the moment anyone freedom that should appeal to both sides of the aisle. If you're a hawkish um, right-wing uh, you know, libertarian who wants a strong military and a good football team and a booming economy, um, feeding children decent food is a, quite a good way of doing all of those things. Um, I want to come in with us a question at the front here. I mean, Eddie knows that better than me. I've got, I've got um, young students messaging me saying, Eddie, because of you, we are cooking a university. We're actually making our own food. And that's what I think we're going, educating the masses rather than sitting here talking and making all that because you know, not, they don't care. They want to know, do I, this food going to make me feel better? And that's where, um, you know, they're sending messages saying, Eddie, we are 18 years old and we're in university and because of you, we're cooking, we're feeling so much better. We, our, my, my, our mental, we're actually able to learn better. Our physical health is improved. And that makes me happy. We're sitting here talking, and um, we're not doing anything because our politicians are not going to do anything. 
anything. That's why I'm shouting. I don't want um, talk because all we do is talk. And then in the, um, in, in the, in the meantime, we're saying that, um, you know, good food is expensive. No. If you've got students making dinners for two days for five pounds, come on. They're buying chicken um, thighs with the skin on, buying vegetables, cooking their own food, and sending me pictures of it every single day. That's, where I, that's what I think we should be doing. We should be educating the masses instead of sitting here talking. I, I love, I mean, can I say, there are things that you can say that I can never say, I think that no one else on this panel can say. And, and there is, it is, we, no, we are never going to put a black octagon on a pack unless someone calls the food shit. Absolutely. That, that isn't going to be me, because no, people, the world is sick of people like me, and you can all name them, Tim, Hugh, Michael, Chris, Jamie. I mean, we even all look the same. No one wants to hear me the food shit and it's wrong from a very different uh, uh, position I come from a very different background you calling the food shit I think is a big part of policy change in, in my opinion we do need but it that. is fucking shit most of it <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna I would have never to, say that we're have... I dare you we're going to have time for more questions later, but first of all, Rosie, um, you're in the House of Lords. You are part of the sort of parliamentary process, um, able to change laws. Um, what's going wrong with our political system? So Henry Dimbleby, who is one of our commissioners, on, he says we've got a nation run by a political class of people who had nannies as children and had a complicated relationship with those nannies. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And that's why they hate the nanny state. Was Jacob well, Rees-Mogg springs to mind. But Jacob, um, what do you, what do you think legislators do? Well, legislators can do everything because at the end of the day, everything is political. And it's about the choice you make about trade and what's in the shops and what you tax it how you regulate the advertising, I mean, everything that's been said. But, I mean, I find, I mean, I've been doing food politics now for a long time, and I find the thing that anyone thinks that what you put in your body doesn't have an effect on you. I find this completely gobsmacking, that the thought that if you bought a Rolls Royce, you mortgaged your house and you bought a Rolls Royce, you would not put Coca-Cola or milk or something like that in the tank and expect that thing to hum along the motorway to even if you're Jacob Rees-Mogg, you would not do it. And the idea that we can put whatever we like into the most sophisticated machine on the world, which is us, and we are the most sophisticated thing going in terms of everything. You know, we have our own internal combustion engine. We have our own heat is the truth. Completely shove junk into it. And it should be called shit and junk because food is just energy. We're just a chemical machine. And I find it extraordinary that you end up in these conversations with people where they don't get that basic, really simple thing that you, it's not quite that you are what you eat, but in a way you are what you eat. And the world is what we eat. It's very, it's heartbreaking and extraordinary and people are very deaf to it. Food is much, much more complicated than tobacco. And even though they're employing the same tactics, it's complicated because at the end of the day, everything about cigarettes is wrong. I, I had lunch with a guy called Liam Donaldson. He was chief medical operator, officer on the, at the time when the smoking bans were brought in. And he said to me, he said the night before we were going to announce it, he said didn't sleep. He didn't know what was going to happen the following day. And he said by lunchtime, he was the most popular man in England. He was just inundated with people saying, thank you, thank you. these fans. It's what we want about that so often, that if someone was actually bold enough, because you know what people think. And I, I chair Feeding Britain, and we run social supermarkets. We have 270 around England, and you know they work that you can shop in them for 30, 40p in the pound, and you belong clubs with different kind of setups. But when we get fruit and vegetables and fresh all the time, because you have to get them through gleaning and all sorts of things. They disappear in five minutes. So when people say to you, oh, poor people don't want that, they want fast food, and you think, just shut up. <laughs> um, just shut up, because you are, you know, as I was saying, you know, J.P. Rees-Mogg had a nanny. I wish we could change the saying to say, I want a parent state. I don't want a fucking nanny. I want a parent <laughs> who, who looks out for me and who says, actually, what you eat is of great concern to me. 
And, you know, after, when we set up the welfare state, we did education, we did health, we did welfare, we did all sorts of things. But the market said, I'll look after food. Oh, you know, 80 years now, 70, 80 years, we've always left it to the market to a point that the system has got so far away from what is basic healthy food that it's incredibly hard to fill that gap and get back. And you can see in politicians both an ignorance and a fear of how do you use that tipping point. The tipping point will come both from money and the, the stats that Tim and everyone was coming up with, you know, about what, what it's costing in health. The fact that Rachel said at the beginning, you know, we've got gazillions of people out of work. Again, this is all to do with poor diet. The evidence is gathering, but actually what MPs in enormous sense, that they can be like Liam Donaldson on the morning he woke up after the smoking ban and be the most popular guy in the room because they stood up to the food industry and they said, this has got to change. And we can change it through the types of regulations that Chris was talking about. First of all, kids weren't... Kids are much smarter than we are about lots of things. And if they saw a black label on that... You haven't even produced your little packet of um, cocoa pops or whatever you've I've got. I've got my prop. I'm saving my prop. I'm saving the prop. Okay, because I know what Warming the it between is. my but thighs. They, oh God, what a thought. <laughs> God, I didn't know you were going to go there. <laughs> but people are much saner. And, and it, the industry is, is gigantic. I mean, I... You know, we, uh, we have set up, I've got, we've got through me and uh, another person called Anne Jenkin, who's an absolutely wonderful Tory peer. We've got a, com uh, a special committee starting on Thursday, which is going to be on the effect of ultra-processed food and diet on obesity and, by extension, health. It's pretty specific in its remit, not quite as specific as we've tried, but nearly. We'll put a public call for evidence out around about the middle of February. You can find is on the House of Lords site. Please submit. It will be read. It will be counted. Uh, we'll have evidence sessions. Uh, and we'll report by the end of July. What I hope it will be, and what we sold it on, was this will not be a report that is funded by the food industry. This will, if people are in the pay of the food industry, they have to declare it, and therefore what they say will be judged against that fact. Because the science committees of the government are made up, well, as Rob, in fact, Rob's, Rob's work and the, at the Soil Association about the makeup of Sacken, is that how you say it? It's horrific, isn't it's it? It's horrific. 16 <laughs> members, 14 indirectly or directly, took money from the food industry. I mean, how can that be seen as an impartial view? So this is what we hope to make happen. And, yeah, okay, sorry. No, you can finish your sentence. Um, <laughs> Well, please, yeah. please send in evidence. Be sure that it's counted. Thanks. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I just wanted to make sure we had some more time for questions. So there was one at the front here, one there, and then uh, one there. So, um, yeah. um, thank you. I. I think some of you have touched a bit on the thing that I wanted to bring up, which is sort of the financial elephant in the room. It's like, how are we going to get people to make better choices, or how are we going to nudge people in the right direction, both from a political and from a personal standpoint, when on a low income, looking at, okay, I don't have very much money to spend. For 99p, I can get a Big Mac and fries, or I can buy one packet of sugar snap peas, which is how much the sugar snap peas cost me tonight. And how are we going to get around that issue in terms of, like, you know, get affordable for people to eat better? Like, I mean, we talked a bit about subsidies and taxes, but that gets very messy very quickly. Okay. And there was a question there. Uh, my question, I'm Sheila Dillon from the Food Program, Radio 4. My question is, how do we move from this UPF industry Oh, sorry. How do we move from this um, UPF, this gigantic UPF industry, this corporate capture, um, without cooking skills being, um, being key? Um, if we look at the United States, most people do not now learn to cook. And houses and apartments are being built with tiny kitchens. That's beginning to happen here. 
um, I had a young kid staying at our house who'd never eaten, a, he was 19, eaten a cooked meal before. Uh, pretty much the norm. And it tends to be in Britain where cooking is seen as uh, trivial and feminine and, you know, we don't talk about that. It's easy to talk about corporate capture. But how do you change a system? I mean, are, are you talking about moving the food industry to non-UPF and we're still completely reliant on that? I mean, that seems to be ludicrous. I mean, you don't get a new attitude to food unless you have some touch. You know, you deal with food. I mean, you, um, Eddie, you talked about um, allotments. Well, what do you do with what you grow in an allotment? Yeah, let's deal with that. I think that's a really interesting point. That I went to Japan for our health commission, and they not only do they cook, the children cook the school lunches regularly. They serve each other every day, the lunch, and they eat at their desks because it's part of the education. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. Did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, I would. I mean, that's a huge question, Sheila, and a really, really important one. I think I'm just going to answer uh, sort of one strand of, of, of a sort of trail of thought, and, and that's that... Um, Many of our poor eating habits are instilled in us from the very youngest age. It's infants and babies who are first exposed to ultra-processed foods. It's a brilliant report by First Step last year exploring some of this. And the effect is not just a poor nutritional intake, it's a disrupted relationship with food as a whole. The, the sensory and tactile experience of being introduced to food, of learning to eat, is disrupted from the youngest age. And if we're going to address this, there are a hundred things we need to do, but the very first thing we need to do is ensure that, that mothers and, and infants uh, can access uh, uh, healthy food, fresh food, and that the, all, all the sort of apparatus around that, the Healthy Start Scheme, nursery food, school food, is geared towards introducing children to real food from the youngest age. And that's not a proper answer, more but important part of the, the picture that we need. Um, two great questions, um, and in a sense, I think they're interrelated. So on the fruit and vegetables question, if everybody in the world wanted to eat five a day, WHO recommendations, the world only produces a third of the amount that would be necessary, subsidized to a huge extent the commodity crop, ultra-processed food. If we took all the subsidies off, the 800 billion subsidies, if we took all of the subsidies off the commodity crops and put them on fruit and vegetables, fruit and vegetables would become much cheaper, much more available, much more widespread, could be used in all sorts of new uh, uh, food items. Uh, uh, Ultra-processed foods would become much more expensive. Um, Industrialised meat would become much more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways that just by changing the subsidy structure, and that's just subsidies, changing the subsidy structure, we change the incentives and food environment and so on. Sheila's exactly right that if we are going to give up convenience and we're going to give up ultra-processed food, the only resort that we have left is to cook or to eat more whole foods or to have a food industry that gives us more whole food type, more diverse diets. The people, we're linear thinkers and we tend to think it's a journey of 20, 30, 40 years. But one of the things that worries me sitting in Chatham House uh, International Affairs Institute is how unstable the world is getting. And what we've seen over the last 10 years, trade wars, Trump, populism, shooting wars in Europe, war in the Middle East, what I can see looking ahead is quite a lot of disruption to the globalized food trades and the globalized supply chains on which our ultra-processed food uh, system. It's a thought experiment that trade becomes expensive and we can't rely on it. Growing more in the UK for UK consumption and making the most of what we uh, can get hold of will push us in the direction of wanting to eat more whole foods because we can't afford the ultra processed food because we can't, it's not available. So I think. As we look ahead in a world of contest and a world of climate disruption, there is a space where events conspire to help us drive in a new situation. And I saw a tweet today from someone in America, for God's sake, we're never going to go backwards and stop eating convenience food. I can imagine many situations where trade is sufficiently disruptive, where convenience foods become too expensive to eat, and it's cheaper 
to buy a packet of lentils and cook them at home with rice in a nice way than it is to go out and buy a microwave ready meal and put it in, a, in your microwave at home. Uh, Chris, do you want to come on either of these points? I guess I've got two thoughts. One is a slightly gloomy response to Sheila, who I've worked with and is a, is a, a count as a, as a friend, which is that, remember, there was very good education about food and there was a culture of cooking and eating. Indeed, there has been one all around the world and it has been very active destroyed by fashion. So I, you know, education at schools about food, and there are some incredible organizations that do this. You know, Taste Ed is a charity that, that builds an entire curriculum. You can learn everything you need to know about maths, chemistry, physiology, art, literature, poetry from, from food. You can build a curriculum around it. Will, if the kids, all that is in front of them is unregulated, ultra-processed food, it, it's sort of you know, pushing rocks uphill, Eddie might have a more colourful metaphor. Um, so education is like on my laundry list of like without which nothing, but it's actually quite a long way below the corporation. There was one other thing that, um, how do we coerce people or how do we get, I can't remember the word you used, but how do we get people to eat less ultra processed food? For me, at least personally, I think what's really important is and I, looking around the room, I, I think maybe many of us need to think about this. Is our ambition, the environmental list, there's an environmental discussion here. In terms of health, get anyone to eat, a, eat less ultra processed food. I think uh, our, our ambition should be about increasing freedom, choice, and opportunity. Now, what, what I subversively know is that we have evidence from Chile, Colombia, when you put the warnings on the pack, children ask their parents to stop buying the food just as we asked our parents to stop smoking. Subversively, I know, I know how we can direct it, but I think if our intention is kind of population management, people are exquisitely sensitive to that kind of control, and they hate it, and that's what they think about the nanny state. But your point about the parental, the loving nanny state, you know, that's, that's how it should be perceived. A top-down people like us, um, it, will, it will always fail. So I think it's about increased choice, freedom, and opportunity. Eddie. My, my, my daughter is a chef, my wife's a chef, so we have got a community and we encourage people to cook. We actually trying to, my daughter's king where she encourages young people to cook and it's working. We need to encourage people like you were saying about when you grow the crops, you grow the crops, you breed the animals and then you learn to cook them. It's not that difficult. I learned to cook. My mum grabbed me by my ear when I was 10 years old because I was leaving the country cook. I thought I, mean, I wasn't interested. She made me sit down crying. She taught me eight different dishes. And I told my, I told my kids, they all know how to make those dishes. And she said, she said cooking was empowering. And we gone too far away from that. And we say, think all ultra processed food is fucking shit. They, they're not, there's no classification. As soon as, 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 as soon as you put that food, it, it's not, because they just, Chemicals added to some, you know, grain usually, and then we eat it, and then we feel bad, and then it affects our gut bacteria, it affects our emotions, the way we are thinking. But we're not realizing that because we're in this in this in a cycle. And I think we should be encouraging people to cook. Cooking is a lot cheaper than we realize. You know, if you go to the supermarket and buy things in bulk, I was a student, and when I was a student as a bodybuilder, I cooked every single meal, and I used to make it in batches and put it in the fridge. It works if you educated people. Let's not sit and pretend that we're being controlled by these corporations. Yeah, they're telling us, oh, you've got to eat that. Look at the TV. Everything is screaming at you, these fucking drinks. And then people are drinking them and eating all of that. I'm saying that. Let's just make, make cooking cool again. And we, let's do it. I think that's end on. And um, please do, Sue's going to come and just have another word in just a second but do look out for our report for the health commission next monday we'll have lots to say about all these issues um you can download it for free outside the paywall uh and thank you so much to everyone for coming and sue uh thank you rachel and thank you all panel you have been absolutely phenomenal really really grateful for the time that you gave up tonight <laughs> Fucking <brilliant. laughs> it's the first time the first time I've not been the sweariest person on the panel, which is um, 
I hope what you've got a little flavour of tonight is, first of all, the complexity of the system, but also the extraordinary amount of really good work that is happening. Eddie, in the grassroots, I can do it, <laughs> teach people how to eat and live well, right through to the scientists, the policy wonks, and the policy makers who are all part of that movement of doing everything all at once. And what we're doing at is my mission. My mission for 2024 is to foment righteous anger around the whole of the country because none of this is okay, none of this is right, from our health through to our environment through to the poverty that's embedded in this system, purpose of the food conversation, because we find when we set out this story, the complexity and the mess of the story, people have brilliant ideas. People are already doing brilliant things in their communities. And what they want are the grown ups back in the room. They don't want like a bunch of mad teenagers running off and doing whatever the hell they like because no one's going to stop them. They want the grown-ups back in the room. And as Adam Smith himself said, business, the bigger the business, the stronger the boundaries needed to ensure that it operates for public benefit. So that's what we're going to be doing all year. Look out for the work that we're doing along with the work that everybody else is doing. The food conversation is going to run all year and into next year. We'll be going all around the country talking to people in places from Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and right around England. Because we think when you ask citizens, what do we really want? A green, we want a healthy, and we want a fair food system. And that is what we have a right to expect. Thank you.